Hey, Arlo and Frank. Coming to you from the backyard. We have a very little backyard, and that's fine. Just enough space here to have a grill. <clears throat> enough space to have a beer. And hang out. We don't hang out here a lot during the early part of the day because the sun is over that way and it's unprotected back here but then as it becomes afternoon we come back here and you don't want to be in front of the house so the hurricane's gone hurricane ian is up the coast now there's great surf but i'm just an old man i'm not going to go out there in the surf today I want to tell you about how I met your grandmother. Rosalind Denise Alford was her name before I made it Rosalind Clark. I went to work at the IRS in 1991. As a revenue officer, I worked in Trenton, New Jersey. And in 1993, I think, Roz Alford and a bunch of other people got transferred from various places over in Philadelphia to become revenue officers. We hired a bunch of people and they were called internal hires. She came over with them. Soon after that, we went from just keeping case files that were paper to be an issued laptops with the cases on the laptop so that you could type in uh, history and do all kinds of computations and stuff like that. We still had the paper files, but we also had the, the laptops and it was called ICS. I had seen Rosalind, but I didn't, I didn't really know her until we started to get the laptops in New Jersey. I put in for a detail to be one of the instructors and support members of rolling out this computer system. So people came from Phoenix and Louisiana because they were the first place in the nation to get them. And then New Jersey and one other place were the next place. So they came up and they took some of us, made us instructors, and support people and then we helped them roll it out and then we all went to the next place which was California and New York and I actually went out to Southern California for six weeks in support of ICS it was kind of a cool time I went surfing hung out with with friends I mean they were co-workers but they were also friends had a blast maybe I'll do another one on that that detail but I first was sent to Edison, New Jersey for I think three weeks. And I went up there and helped, helped them after, after they came out of class, I was their support person. And I helped them and then I got a call one day saying, look, after, after you're done there, we want you to get down to, to, I think it was Camden at the time. Eventually the Camden office was transferred to Cherry, Cherry Hill. Camden office was in the ghetto. Cherry Hill office was in like a nice business area near the Cherry Hill Mall. But I think this was still in Camden. So I showed up and I, I supported Nancy Daniels' group and Rosalind Alford was in that group. But I still didn't really know her or anything. There were people there that I knew. There were people that I had gone through phase one, phase two, and phase three of revenue officer training with who were there. You know, people who came on with me who I'm still friends with some of them. But the new people, I really didn't know any of them. And, and at this time, I think they were there maybe a year and we were rolling this thing out. But I did notice one thing. 
that she scared me. And I, I, I mean, I've, had, I've met some scary women in my life, but I've never had a woman that took my breath away by scaring me. And I had no idea what that meant. I just knew that when I would go up to her, I was afraid to talk to her. I um, kind of became like a blathering idiot in a way. At the time I was living with Judy, and that's another story for another day, but she was my girlfriend and there were five kids uh, your dad's, Alex, Becca, and Jim. And, and Judy and I were raising all of them as one family. But we were kind of getting to the end of our relationship. And my parents uh, were getting old. They were moving to Stone Harbor. And I was going to wind up like leaving Judy and, and going down, taking your dad's down to Stone Harbor, putting them in school there. I think it was when my son Tom was a freshman. And so I went through this detail and the only thing that I knew about her was that she scared me. And when I would see her after that, if we were at a, a CPA, continuing professional education event or a class or something, I would say hi to her. I knew her, but she scared the be Jesus out of me. Fast forward a couple years, and I was living in Stone Harbor, working in Trenton. Brutal commute, two hours and 45 minutes each way. And we had to go in the office every day. Or if I didn't go in the office, I had to go to the field. And the field was even further. It was above Trenton where I worked. So I got a deal from one of the bosses there. I think he was a branch chief. Eventually they were called territory managers, but at this time it was it was the branch chief. A guy named Steve Amadio. He said, I want you to, to go there and work um, putting this team together in, in, by this time it was Cherry Hill. And go down there and Nancy Daniels' team we had had some success up in Trenton working cases as teams instead of just each individual working the case. We had enough success that he, that he wanted to try that out in Cherry Hill. So I went down there and Roz Alford was one of the people that was put on my team. She called, she didn't, when, when they heard that I was coming down there, she didn't know who I was by name. Judy used to send me to work with homemade lunches. So I would go there with a bowl of usually something like matzo ball soup. Um, they were actually very good. And, and I'd walk around and, and eat lunch while I was helping the people with their computers when I was back in Camden supporting them in that. So she was talking to this lady named Brenda Jones Miller and, and BJM said, hey, you know who that guy is. He's the soup bowl guy. Oh, the guy that walks around with the soup bowl? Well, yeah, he's a nice guy, so I'll be cool working for him. So I, I show up and she's on my team. I would make lists of things for people to do because I was in charge of all these cases and and I probably should have asked people what they think should have happened, but I didn't take that approach because I was successful enough doing what I was doing that I just said, look, I want you to do A, B, and C, and then let me know what happens and we'll go, we'll go from there. I mean, I wasn't a complete tyrant, but Roz didn't like it. One day, um, well, let me back up a minute. We went to the field as a group sometimes, there'd be five people, or it might just be two people. So I'd go with people and 
and we'd make a field visit. We took the amount of people we thought was the, the correct amount for that job. And one time I went with Roz, she had this white Ford. She was wearing this white um, dress that was made out of wool. And when she drove, um, you could see her legs. And I remember sitting there going, oh, I can't look at her legs <laughs> because I'll get sued for sexual harassment. So I just sat there in the car. And I knew that I was gonna to go to the field with her. And by this time I knew that I was attracted to her. That I, it wasn't that I was afraid of her, but it was something that I never felt for a woman before. And, and it felt like I was afraid, but I was probably afraid of what it meant to me. In um, current America, there still are challenges when you're a mixed race couple and she's black and I'm white. So there's a lot of people that don't like that. A lot of whites, a lot of blacks. Most people say they're okay with it, but yeah, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. And I was afraid of that too. But anyway, one day I told her to do something on one of the cases and she said, I don't think we should do that. And I said, well, look, go ahead and do it. About 10 minutes later, Nancy, the, the boss, called me in and said, I forbid you to talk to Roz Alford. I said, what are you talking about? She said, you just need to sit down and listen to me and you're not allowed to go out and talk to her afterwards. So I said, okay. She wants off the team. She's tired of you bossing her around, giving her this. And I said, well, maybe by tomorrow she'll want to be back on. And she said, look, I'm not letting her go back on. Don't go talk to her. In fact, I think she made me go out to the field, like grab some cases, go to the field, don't have anything to do with it. So I'm like, oh, that sucks. Well, at the same time that that was going on, she was doing things like taking all the things off my desk and hiding them and like puppy love things. And I thought, hmm. What's up with this? So, there was a group called the Katinas that were going to be at, at Calvary Chapel in Northeast Philadelphia, and I had become a born again Christian in '96. That was my church. And I thought, I would really like to ask this woman out on a date, but I'm I mean, she wouldn't even be on this team with me. <clears throat> oh, the Katinas are coming to Calvary Chapel. They were, a, a, I think, a trio or a quartet, a vocal quartet of Samoans that sing Christian music. It's, it's, they're beautiful songs that they sing very good group and they were coming I think on a Saturday night or something and I thought well she's got a daughter Courtney so what I'll do is I'll ask her to go to church with me and Courtney will probably like this group and that's what I did I said, look, you know, I'm going to see the Katinas. She didn't know who it was. I, I think I had made a tape of some of their stuff. And I said, you, know, you have a daughter, Courtney. She had the, you know, picture of Courtney on her desk. And you know, so I knew who Courtney was. Everybody knew who the kids of the people in, yeah. in, in the group were. So I said, would you like to bring Courtney? We can grab a bite to eat beforehand, and then we'll, we'll go see the, the group. 
she said, sure, sure, I'd like to do that. Now my heart was pumping. Boom, 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 boom. I lived in Stone Harbor and she lived in Upper Darby. To get to her house, I had to go out Walnut Street, all the way out to the end. I guess it's Cobbs Creek Parkway and then make a left and go up into Upper Darby. I was on my way and I thought, there's plenty of people out there on streets like Walnut Street selling flowers. So I'll grab a couple bouquets, one for her and one for Courtney on the way. This is before cell phones and GPS and all that kind of stuff. So I had directions, they were written down. I'd go out Walnut Street and then I got lost. So I ran into a flower shop and I thought, well, flower shops make deliveries all over the place. So I'm gonna go in and ask how to get to this place. They'll know. And, and then I'll buy some flowers. So I asked them how to get there. They gave me the directions. I wrote them down and, and they said, well, what kind of flowers do you want? I said, I, I want, a larger bouquet for a mother and then a smaller bouquet for an 11 year old daughter. Like, okay, how much money do you want to spend? And I, I didn't know. <laughs> I hadn't bought flowers for a woman in a while. I said, $25. Well, at the time I had a pickup truck and it had a cap over the back. It was a Nissan pickup truck, really cool four-wheel drive. I took them and put them in the back of the pickup truck and, and there were enough flowers. I mean, it didn't fill the back up or anything, but there were enough flowers in there that I thought, wow, it looks like this is a, a part of a funeral procession gone take the hearse with all the flowers in the back. So I, I drive over and I drive up the street. I'm looking for her dress. And I see Courtney, who I recognize from the picture, on on the step. And I parked and I got out and I, I said, are, are you Courtney? She said, yes. Looking at me like, I'm not supposed to talk to strangers. And, and I said, well, I have something for your mom. Your mom's expecting me. Is, is she here? And she said, well, yeah, she's, upstairs getting ready to go on a date. And I said, oh, okay. Come out to the, the car, cause I, I also have something for you. So she came out kind of sheepishly and I, I said, this bouquet is for you. And then the other's for your mom. So we went in and, and went upstairs. Uh, your grandmother actually, when I was walking up the steps, was curling her hair with this hot curling iron and she sit, singed her forehead. So that night she had this big singe mark on it. And we went on the date. I found out later that Courtney thought she was going out with this other guy from our work, this black guy. She didn't know his name. She didn't know who I was but she just didn't think it was gonna be a white guy. So she thought that I was a Chinese delivery man because I have that, that kind of squinty eyes. And that's what she did. She went up and told her mom, like, there's a Chinese delivery man down here. He's got flowers for you and me. Like, Chinese delivery man? I'm, I'm expecting a guy named Frank. So I went up and, and, and we went on the date at the, uh, it was a good time. Courtney didn't like me much at first, but we made peace with each other and now we love each other dearly. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. Peace out, guys.